Amen. Praise God. Well, we are on the fifth part of my seven-part series called Press In. For those who um, were here last week, you know um, I'm continuing on from last week's message. Last week I looked at kind of our spiritual health, our spiritual well-being. Uh, and this week we're looking at um, our succession plan or our legacy that we're going to live. Uh, kind of the main crux of this sermon series was out of um, John Andrews' book, Luke 2.52. Luke 2.52 says this, And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and with man. And um, just so you know, I'm a huge fan of John Andrews. I listen to his podcast, so back, if you haven't listened to them, two text podcasts, him and Dr David Harvey, talking through um, two texts uh, each week. And they're going through the book of Acts right now incredible um encourage you if you listen to podcasts um one you should listen to if you don't listen to podcasts listen to podcasts and that's one that you should listen to and we have um books john andrews come and speak um for us as a church next a year at the beginning of march he's going to come and do a bible weekend for us so a bit like the bible week that we're going away for this week he's going to come on a saturday and do something for us and we can invite local churches and friends to join us with that and then he's going to come and speak on the Sunday um, morning for us as well so that's the beginning of March so um, put the date around that and ring around that because that's going to be amazing. Um, so the book is uh, 252 Learning to Grow on Purpose Lessons from Jesus' Hidden Years by Dr John Andrews and the Sam Chan podcast is another one that I listen to which gave me the pressing acronym that I have borrowed to use for us to help us um, look through. So the pressing, we looked at physical and mental well-being. We've looked at our relational health, our emotional health. Last week we looked at our spiritual health, and today we're looking at succession plan. And I joked last week saying that um, it's all right. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. But we need to think about the legacy that we're going to leave. And then the last two will be income and our ability to say no. Charles Spurgeon says, the most needful and profitable labour is which we spend upon our own mental and spiritual improvement. Not bad for a guy who died over 200 years ago, but actually was had his finger on the pulse before spiritual health, um, maybe, maybe more than 200 years ago. 1500, was this Spurgeon? 1800, yes, yeah, so 200 years ago. Um, had his finger on the pulse 200 years before it became something that we talk about nearly every day, spiritual and mental well-being. Um, so we're going to look at today our spiritual, no, our succession, our legacy, what that's going to look like. Before we do, just want us to say, today marks five years since I took over from Pastor Peter, my first sermon I preached um, five years ago as a part of this church. Um, and so I just feel the way that this kind of sermon series is linked in this Sunday being five years in succession. Um, just want to give glory to God for the five years that I've been able to lead this church um, and building upon the legacy and the foundation that Pastor Peter left and his father before him, um, Pastor John. So nothing like keeping it in the family, eh? Three generations of one family. So, but. Praise the Lord for what he's doing. Um, the best way to use that as a timeline, Reuben's birthday was on Friday, and then Joel was in Lydia's tummy just before um, she, she gave birth to him. Um, so Joel is five in August. So however old Joel is, is however long I've been the pastor of the church. So that's the way that you can kind of keep track. So if you ever, ever wonder how long it's been, just ask me how old Joel is, and that's the way that you can work out. So he's the gauge that we go by. Um, but as I was, as I said, I was jokingly, I said last Sunday, and um, talking about succession, I'm not going anywhere. I don't plan to go anywhere. God has got me here for a time, a season, a purpose, uh, and um, as long as I've got breath in my body, I'm going to give everything that God's got um, for us in this place. And it has been an interesting journey. When I did um, my ministers in training, which was called Fit Program back then, um, there wasn't a section that we covered global pandemics. Um, and um, that was kind of learning on the job as you, as you had to do it. So we have been through um, something that not many other leaders have gone through. 
um, and so and churches have gone through in this in the way that we have so um, just want to thank all of you for the way that you have um, supported and have been as a church together over the past two and a half years so I was sharing a breakfast with a friend on Tuesday morning a guy who recently retired from the ministry and um, we were sharing about our own experiences of church and lockdowns and stuff. He retired at the end of last year and um, kind of just connected with him saying, well, how, how are things? How are you? And he said, yeah, I'm great. He said, the pressure's off, the weight's off. And he said, I've got to be careful to who I share this with, but he said, it's just nice just to be in a church when nobody knows my name. Currently, he's going around different churches every Sunday because he wants to feel where God's leading him. He said there's no pressure, there's no anxiety, there's no kind of being on call 24-7. And um, I'm like, mate, you're selling retirement really well to me right now, but I'm nowhere near it yet. So, um, but he was about um, how the burnout was real, how burnout was real. And we've talked about, we, about our physical, our emotional, our relational health, and actually all of that combined with our spiritual health, burnout is real trying to do stuff, trying to pour out of something of us that's empty and there's nothing to give it, it's real. And someone described it the other day, that burning the candle at both ends and then when there's nothing left to give, what do you have to burn out? But it's gone, because you're burnt out, you're, you're doing too much. And we shared about um, how he needed refueling and refilling. And um, I'm giving you a two year notice now, okay? Five years I've been the pastor. The church have kindly said in their contract to me that I can have a sabbatical. So, in two years' time, I will be having a sabbatical, three months off. So, it's not coming as a shock, all right? Two years' notice. If anyone turns around and says, well, no one told me. <laughs> I did, two years ago, because I don't want to be in that position that he was in, a burnout. I need refueling, I need <coughs> refilling, I need to hear what God is saying. And I need just some time just to recharge the battery. So, two years' time, I'll be on sabbatical. Pardon? Made he's made a note. Anne's made a note. <laughs> Baby's made a note. Rob's made a note. It's all in. It's all. It's all documented. <laughs> but so I can recharge, refill, be ready to lead us as a church and as a congregation where God has got us, the direction He wants us to go. Okay. So. Luff said about that, you know, between myself and the pay committee and the rest of the church council, we'll work that out over the next two years, you have plenty of notice to understand what that's going to look like, okay? Because I want to leave a legacy in this place. I want to leave a legacy that whoever comes in after me is in a better position than I was when I took over from Pete. Whoever comes in after me has got a church that is, has a direction where God is leading them and has a, has a congregation who are on fire for the things of God and, and believing for the things of God. And I need to impart that into you, but I need to be refueled to be able to do that. I've been a member of this church for 15 years. I've never been in a church any longer than this one. I love this church. I want God's very best for this place and everyone in here. This church has had its ups and downs in the last 15 years. I can remember the first um, few times, few years that I was in this place, where we as a church had to have emergency um, general meetings because we were worried we couldn't pay people or live a salary. And that's a great place to be when I'm going to be taking over a job and my father-in-law's job's at risk and my wife's job was at risk. But by God's grace and by God's glory, we haven't been in that position in the last five years. That serves an amen and a clap of church because that's God. That's not, that's not fluke, that's not luck, that's not, oh, we've just got through. No, that's God showing us his provision, his favour is on us. And that's thanks to the church council, to the trustees, to the, the treasurer, Alan, before and now Steve, um, who's taken over that role. But we've been blessed by a legacy left in this place. 
by my father-in-law and his father before him. And I want whoever comes in after me to be walking in that blessing and that favour. Do you know, as Sandra led uh, and read us in that, that psalm, Psalm 118, I was listening to um, a worship song coming in and just on my heart I was listening to Matt Redmond's and Blessed Be Your Name that he gives and he takes away. And that was a song that I was listening to the day that um, Reuben had just been born, the day before my nan had just passed away, and two weeks after that, Lydia's nan would sadly then pass away, but glory should go on to be with Jesus. Within a two week period, our lives changed upside down, inside out, back to front, and 180 degrees, we just didn't know what was going on. But in it all, God remained faithful. In it all, God remained the one thing that we could rely on. And I remember driving out of Dorchester County Hospital at around half 11. Reuben had just been put in Skabu, I'd just seen Lydia. And all the emotions and all of kind of the literally 48 hours, so I don't think I slept much at all after my nan died and we were then rushed into hospital and kind of just, just exhaustion. And I remember singing that song with tears rolling down my face. But it says, Lord, you give and take away, but I will say in my heart, blessed be your name. I will choose to worship you. I will choose to sing praises to you. I will choose to pour out my life in spirit and truth to a God that, Lord, I don't know what the situation holds for me. I don't know. I don't understand why I'm going through it, Lord. But you know what? Regardless, still my soul will say yes and amen to the Lord. And one definition I found on leaving a legacy, it means this, giving something that will be valued and treasured by those who survive after your death. It requires though to ensure that any items that have meaning to you will also have meaning to those who designate to inherit them. Do I believe as a church the greatest legacy that we can live and leave to anyone is the legacy of knowing Jesus? If we leave any legacy as a church is that we point people to Jesus and continue to point people to Jesus and that Jesus is the number one thing that we leave so as parents as grandparents we celebrated Father's Day didn't we just a few weeks ago the greatest legacy that we can live as parents grandparents brothers sisters whatever you fall into whatever category the greatest legacy that you can leave to your family to your friends <coughs> is that they know Jesus is that you point them towards Jesus. I was um, listening to um, and reflecting on, you know Lydia, last time, a couple of times she spoke, a few, uh, few times ago she spoke, she had pictures up, didn't she, of her grandparents and how, um, an impact that they made in her life. And I was um, reminded of a conversation that I had with Andy um, David, who um, runs an organisation called world of worth that we support as a church and have done for years and he was sharing about the impact that Idris had made in his life growing up as a young lad who'd moved from um, the, the north where his granddad was moving down to um, Devon to move to Exeter but actually the the years and the constant support and the constant love that Idris showed him really molded and shaped him to be the person that he is today and i was thinking that's what the legacy is about isn't it about when you look at back at people's lives i'm that person because of them because of the impact that they've made in me it's interesting on wednesday i joined the um, wednesday house group rob nearly fell on his when he saw that I walked in, he goes, oh, you're, you're joining us today. I said, yes, I am. But we were talking about Solomon. And we were talking about, actually, the mistakes that Solomon made. And we looked at um, 1 Kings 3, where Solomon asked God for wisdom, but yet he's just married Pharaoh's daughter. So already he's set himself up to fail. God was pretty clear. Don't intermarry. Don't allow... Um, the world to get into the things that I've got for you. And then we got to um, chapter 11, we can see the kind of spiral 
of what had gone on. Actually, how he did it, I'll never know. 700 wives and princesses, 300 concubines, how one man can please a thousand women, I never know. I find it difficult to please just one. <laughs> but he says that in his heart, he loved every single one of them. And in his heart was pulled in every which way and direction. And what is Solomon's legacy is actually he's remembered more for this fall and what happens and how it all came crumbling down as opposed to remember for the wisdom and the glory that God had poured into him. Actually, when you think of him, actually, no, Solomon was a great man of wisdom, even that's what he asked God for, but actually he's remembered for maybe more than his fall, falling into sin, and actually then being who God had called him to be and raised him up to be. When many of us talk of legacy, I think lots of us jump, don't we, to inheritance straight away, and we'll get on to that a little bit later, but just a couple of scriptures just to kind of help us with our ideas. Proverbs 13, 22 says, a good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children, but a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. Psalm 78 verse 4 says, I will not hide from their descendants. I will not tell, well, sorry, we will not hide them from their descendants. We will not tell, we will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and his wonders he has done. We need to tell our descendants, we need to tell our friends, our family about the works that God has done. I was reminded again, thinking about when I wrote, uh, was reading, getting sermon ready, um, last year when we did the boot camp, the Soul Winner boot camp, and Gina Elms and his wife says, well, I talk to my friends who aren't walking with the Lord as if they're walking with the Lord. So I tell them what's going on at church. I tell them what God is doing. I tell them every single day that I get an opportunity to say this is what God is doing. I don't care if they're not coming to church right now. I'm going to keep on telling them what God is doing and what God is up to. Can I encourage us, church? Have the faith. Have the confidence. Have the boldness to encourage our people, our friends, our family, our loved ones who are not walking with the Lord right now. Tell them what God is doing. Tell them what he's up to. Tell them the things that he's doing so they can say, God, look at that. They're telling me a lot of stuff that God's doing and then they're going to test me to see that it's actually happening. Keep on telling them. Keep on encouraging them. Ask the Lord to give you opportunities to share. Step out in faith. Step out in boldness. Be wise about it. Don't Bible bash them. Don't rum it down their necks. But when the opportunity's there, just say, oh, do you know what God did this week in church? Well, we've been praying for this person and they shared a testimony. You, you see that testimony as an example. Oh, I was so blessed and encouraged this week about one minute Steve was praying and asking God and saying, Lord, just give me to where I'm going to get a chance to go and see him. And then asking his mum, how's dad? And being the camera flipped round and just, whoa, dad, you're looking really well. Use examples, use things like that. Why? Because the Bible says we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Let's be encouraging everyone that we can do that. Psalm 103, 17 to 18 says, But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness is with their children's children, those who have kept his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. So, uh, Proverbs 22 verse 6 says, Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. We want to put those truths, those biblical principles in our young children's lives. I love putting Joel to bed, and he's getting a little bit cheeky with it now. He was very cheeky with Lydia with it last night. Lydia has a routine <coughs> about putting to bed. I have a routine when I put him to bed. And I read best bedtime stories, um, Lydia says, to Joel then, than she does. But he plays up on it now. He'll go, um, have a nice day. And then we have to go through all the everything he's done in the day. So yesterday we went to go and see um, uh, Caleb and Isabel and Luke and Andy and Kate um, at Moore's Valley. So he rattled off what he'd done. We went, where did we go today? Went to the park. And what did we do? We went on a slide. And then what else? Oh, we saw Auntie Kate's 
and I'll put Andy and he'll go through it all. But when he's about to go to bed, he'll then say, and, and say our prayers. And so then he'll try and say prayers with him. But I love saying prayers with him because when we pray our prayers, and then he says, and he really says it, Amen. He really takes notice. And then we say, Who are we going to pray for now? And then we'll start saying some names of family members. And we'll pray for them. Yeah, pray for them. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, Amen. Starting him off young, believing, reading his Bible to him, getting those stories in. And they're not just stories, they're God's words, they're truth, they're power, they're life, they're, they're the thing that's going to last forever. The Bible says that his word will remain. Heaven and earth will fade away, but his word will remain. That truth, getting into him young. John 3, verses uh, 1. Sorry, John 3, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, says this, the, the elder, to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in truth, dear friend, I pray that you may be in good health and that you all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It, is, it gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in truth. That's what this is about. That's what John was saying, writing that letter to his friend Gaius, that he was continuing to walk in the truth, continuing to walk in the way that he had laid out before them. In the podcast that I've been listening to, in the Sam Chan podcast around this, where I've got the... Um, the kind of the idea he was paraphrasing um, when he says about our lives he says we live our lives by design we live on purpose we have a purpose for everything that we do but when it comes to succession or legacy sometimes we just fall into default mode sometimes you just allow things just to happen without any purpose any design around it and he said this inheritance is what you're going to leave behind Legacy is who you leave behind. Inheritance is what you're going to leave behind. Legacy is who you are going to leave behind. Who are we leaving behind on purpose? Jesus left his legacy in his disciples. He spent three and a half years with them. He didn't get a holiday. He didn't get a sabbatical. But he spent three and a half years pouring into the 12 but even more than that he had his inner circle he had his three that he poured into peter james and john luke 8 51 to 56 says that when jesus arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not um, let anyone go in with him except peter john and james and the child's father and mother meanwhile all the people were wailing and mourning for her to stop stop wailing jesus said she's not dead but asleep they laughed at him knowing that she was dead, but he took her by the hand and said, my child get up. Her spirit returned and at once she stood up and Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Mark 9, 2-10. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James and John with him and led him up to a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said "Jesus to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. <laughs> Absolutely, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, that they were so frightened. Isn't that amazing? I love it. Peter says the first thing that comes into his head. So frightened, didn't know what to do. Like, uh, shall I build you a sh shall I build you a, sh a, 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 a hut for you to stay? A shed for you just to, to stay in this place? Like, what else do you say? Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and the voice came from the cloud: "This is my son. Love, listen to him." Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had been risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. Jesus had his inner three. 
Jesus poured his ministry, his life, everything that God had given him into his disciples. And we read about the impact that they had on others after he ascended to heaven. The Holy Spirit came on them in power and they then became legacy carriers. They carried the legacy that Jesus had poured into them. They carried it with them and they poured out into people that they were dealing with. So what they received from Jesus, they didn't just hold it from themselves, they gave it out. And that's why we read in scripture it says that we need to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Continually filled with the Holy Spirit. That we're always giving out and pouring out what God is doing in us. That we don't do it from our own strength or our own experiences or our own understanding. But we do it from the Holy Spirit pouring into us. What we have received from him we give to others. What we receive from him we give to others. The challenge for each of us here today is that who are we investing in? Who are we pouring into right now? Whose lives are we pouring into that when we die, maybe this side of heaven, unless the Lord tarries, when people come to our funeral and say, I'm this person because of them. I'm this person because of the example that they set. I'm here today because of what they did in my life. I want to close with a few pictures of some people that have poured into my life. Hopefully it's going to come up on the screen now. And I think about the legacy that some people have poured into me. First photo, please, Bill. This is Pastor Stephen Jonathan and his wife Julie. They're my first pastors that really impacted me. So when I became a Christian at Town of Eden Church, they're still the pastors at Town of Eden Church now. Um, I'm doing not yet. <laughs> <laughs> He's too happy, isn't he? Um, Stephen did a series through the Gospel of John two and a half years. He teaches at um, the Bible College for Eden in systematic theology. He literally took every verse from the Gospel of John and we looked at it for two and a half years. The greatest foundation you could have starting off your walk with the Lord. But these guys um, saw something in me that I didn't see. <coughs> I went to Soul Survivor and as I go to Soul Survivor I know and um, Stephen uh, came round to uh, my house and, and said to my mum, you know he has a, a pastor's heart. I can see that in Mark and that's what he saw in me when I was 15 years old. Next slide please. Yeah, thank you, um, this is um, Pastor John Skelton, who was pastor at King Standing Eden Church. Um, he was um, a young man of God whose dad um, was a um, and his dad is very good friends with lots of OG leaders, even though they're an Eden church. Um, where there's good connections, where there's good um, work within the community, the church leaders together. Um, we left Town of Eden for a short period, went to um, this church in King Standard. He's now left and he's now at Rugby Eden Church. Um, but he, again, saw something in me as a young leader and had. Um, a church weekend away where he invited John Glass, who was very good friends of his because of his dad's connection, um, but came and did um, a Bible weekend for us away. And it was kind of in that weekend that God really cemented something in me about being a pastor and going on that journey. Next slide, please. Then we have um, Dell and Carol Barefoot. Uh, who many of you will know, Dell married myself and Lydia, but I was in his church. Um, first church I ever got an opportunity to preach in, because he saw something in me, gifted me to preach. Um, I was petrified. I've shared the story with you many times. Why I never preach in a suit jacket, um, unless it's a funeral, is because the first time I preached, um, I had a suit jacket on and I had a lovely and blue shirt on and I went to take my suit jacket off and I had sweat patches 
the size of a wok on both sides. It's like, ah, oh, I'm not taking that off when I was hot and sweaty. But Dan and Carol were never blessed with physical children, but they had many, many spiritual children, and I count it an honour to be one of their spiritual sons. Next slide, please. Len Randall, who was my youth leader um, at the time when I was at Welling, um, a mighty, mighty man of God, um, a guy from Sierra Leone. The only thing that I don't like about him is support Spurs, but other than that, I love everything. <laughs> but, <laughs> however, we had banter, we had fun, but he's someone who speak the truth in love, sometimes speak the truth when it needed to be spoken in maybe a harsh word, but still be true, um, and someone who cares passionately and deeply and someone who's still cheering me on, even though I haven't been part of his church for a very long time. Thank you, Dad. When I was about to almost walk away from the Lord, God had placed me after going from that church in Wellington to a church in Crayford. And uh, Tim and Kerry, again, saw something in me that I hadn't seen myself. And um, it's because of Dr. Sandy coming to this church, and I believe David phoning Tim to say, we've had these, this team from America over, do you want to have them? And Tim could have said yes or no, but he said yes, but I believe the Holy Spirit said they need to come. That's why Dr. Sandy came to my church in Crayford in the February. In the September, I went to America. I met Lydia. <coughs> And if you don't know the story, come and speak to me afterwards and we'll just have a cup of tea. But yeah, these guys saw something in me, poured into me hope and vision and love and encouragement. Next slide, please, John. Mark and Tara. Tara is Tim and Kerry's daughter. And they were my youth leaders when I was at their church in Crayford. Again, pouring something into me, pouring life, going on Soul Survivor together and having the opportunity to just do so much, give me the opportunity to, to, to talk and to share and, and lead a Bible study, starting me off at a great foundation, but it's because of what she was poured into from her mum and dad that she could then pour out that encouragement, that, um, that way of doing things. Next slide, please. And, uh, and the governor. <laughs> years and years of supporting him. Years and years of, um, well, the first year I moved down to Dorchester, I lived in his house. So I saw every bit of him, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But I saw his passion for this place, his passion for God's people, his passion for God's word. This picture was taken with us in Bulgaria, had many, many painful trips with him in Bulgaria, many times um, we've, we didn't even know if we were going to get out of the, out of the church that evening alive because of stuff that was happening. But yeah, his passion, his commitment, his encouragement to me over the last kind of year and a half of us transitioning over, him giving me more responsibilities in this place and him taking a step back for him who'd served in this church for 41 years, actually that was a big thing. A really big thing. Conversations that we've had privately that I'll never share publicly, but just his honour and the way that he led and then gave me the freedom to lead in my way, to take a step away from this place. Imagine you've been in a place for 41 years and then all of a sudden, you can't, you, you make the decision not to go there anymore. Not that you can't come, but you make the decision not to go there anymore. That's a sacrifice to be made, and I honour him for that every single day. Next slide, please. Ian Williams, a friend of this church for many, many years. And I connected with him on Facebook, like I do with lots of people. And I remember going to, to a, a conference in Torquay for the first time, and um, I always go because Denise came with us to this conference as well. And he gave me a hug like he'd known me all my life. 
and Denise walked past him to go to the toilet and he didn't even recognise her. She always makes a comment, oh, I walked past and he never saw me, he never <laughs> saw me. But he recognised me, he gave me this hug, like I was a long lost friend, and instantly there was a connection, a guy that I cried with, a guy that I've shared with, a guy that I've poured out my heart with, but a guy that has always been there and always had that word of wisdom to speak into my life. Next slide, please. Both guys in this photo, Jordan Williams and his granddad Derek. Derek is Ian's dad and we've had the pleasure of having uh, Derek preach in his church many years ago and both his sons Ian and Nigel have spoken in his church but Derek, um, over the lockdown, sadly went to be with the Lord, but he had poured and poured and poured his life out supporting, raising leaders, encouraging leaders. He was the little dancing boy, they nicknamed him, because whenever he was worshipping, he was dancing. He was dancing and worshipping Jesus, but he lived a life of integrity and when you, if you ever have a chance to listen to and watch the funeral again, it was because of Derek I'm here today, because of Derek and Maxi I'm here today, because of the life that they live, I'm here today now serving the Lord. And Jordan as well, he's a few years younger than me, but he's someone who encourages, someone who supports, someone who is learnt from his granddad and his dad and it's now doing it to others, pouring into their lives. I um, had the pleasure of having just some time with him at um, a conference, we went out for lunch together, uh, and just spending that time, you need people around you to build you up, to encourage, to talk into your life, and for me, Jordan is one of those guys, and he always will be. I had a chat with him over KFC, Derek Orr used to run KFC, I was listening to, and the few, oh, no wonder I loved him so much because he always gave his kids and his grandkids KFC. I was talking to Jordan and I said to him, and this was years ago, before he took over, he recently took over from his dad as the pastor of the church, I said, how do you cope with almost like the pressure that's on you? Your granddad's this great man of God, just ultimate respect in the Assemblies of God Southwest for all that he's done for over the years. Your, your dad at that point was the area leader and part of the national leadership team and it's almost like this succession plan had been paved out for him. How do you cope with that? He said, I don't care about that. He said, I honour my granddad, I honour my dad, but I just want to be Jordan who loves Jesus. And wherever I go, that's, that's enough for me. And listening to his story about how he took over from the church from his dad, he didn't want it. He didn't want it, he wasn't praying about it, he wasn't seeking after it, and in his heart he made the decision, I'm going to support John, who was the number two, to be the number one. And just within days of it being kind of official, and the application going, time of prayer, and God said, no, Jordan, you're the number one, and John, no, you're the number two, and John phoned Jordan and said, mate, I've got to speak to you. And he goes, yeah, I've got to speak to you. And God had just worked it together. And now he's taken over and building on the legacy that his dad had paid from that church. And then the final one. Could have not say anything about this guy, Meshek, who um, I met at an AOG training weekend down in um, Newton Abbott. Um, and we just connected straight away. And our hearts and our spirits just connected and he has poured life into me and I've been able to pour life into him. You need people around you who are gonna leave a legacy, who you're gonna pour into, who's gonna encourage you, who's gonna support you. And he's been that guy for me. And um, to the point of where we met in February this year and we haven't been able to meet up in person, we talk most weeks on the phone, we're WhatsApping, we're texting each other all the time. And he said to me, oh, we need to meet. I said, yeah, we need to meet. So we, we, we made it happen. We met at the Asda in Bournemouth, where we're going to be going this week. And there is a McDonald's there, so that's where we went. We didn't meet for Asda George food. We met for, for, for worse than that, we met for McDonald's. But we met, and um, he said to me, uh, I feel God's calling me away from him. I said, okay. 
And God had kind of been speaking to me to want to encourage me that uh, with a word for him. And he said, yeah, I've been um, offered this job at AOG. I thought, okay. And he goes, um, yeah, so I'm just about to go to the toilet. So if you could pray now, and when I come back, tell me what the Lord said. I'm like, okay, talk about no pressure. Talk about... Uh, <laughs> And it looks at everything hanging, almost like hanging on every word I'm about to say. But it was a confirmation. God had spoken to me over to Bournemouth saying, I've got a word for you for, for me, Chef. I thought, okay. And then him sharing that, and I was able to pray. Gave him a word. <coughs> Prayed for him as he was going up to Manchester the next couple of weeks to have his interview. Praying as he was waiting to hear. And then was the first to cheer him up. As the head of church planting, Gray G in the UK. So to see him and his trajectory and where God is taking and know that we are pouring into each other's hearts, into each other's lives, supporting one another, encouraging one another. You might want to look back, maybe over some photos, look back at some of your um, sermon notes and actually look at some of the people that are poured into you. I was only reminded of doing this when, I met, when we met on Wednesday because David mentioned a guy that came and preached here regularly during John Rock's days and saying about actually the, the impact that he had, the ministry that God used him for, but he always prayed, Lord, protect my heart, protect me from falling, protect me from stumbling. Because we need men and women around us to encourage us, but we need also men and women to speak truth into our lives. When we see something going wrong and we can say in love, hey brother, hey sister, that's not right. We need to give that to Jesus. So I encourage us that we need to get our hearts right before we come to communion. The Bible encourages us to make sure that there's nothing in our hearts against one another, that we don't eat that judgment upon ourselves. And we'll look at that more, I'm guessing, on Friday the 15th. But look back. Look and see who God has placed in your life, who's left a legacy and is continuing to leave a legacy in you. And then think, God, who am I doing that to? Who am I pouring into? Who am I encouraging? Who, when they say, if they come to our funeral, I'm here today because of that person, today because of what that person imparted into my life. Let's pray together, church. Hallelujah. Lord, we do give you the glory and the honour for what you are doing in this place, for what you're doing in our lives. And ultimately, Lord, it is your legacy that you are pouring into each and every one of us, that your kingdom come and will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, I pray you'd help us as a church, Lord, to be consistent in people's lives, to continue to pour into those lives, Lord. The people around us, our friends, our family, our, our work colleagues maybe, Lord, brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord, who encourage us, who build us up, who pour into us, Lord, and we pour into them. And Lord, we pour in out of what you have given us, your grace, your goodness, your mercy, your truth, your love, your word, your spirit, all of these things, Lord, that you use to make us up and to shape us into the people that you want us to be. Lord, I pray you help us, Lord, to leave a legacy, Lord, that is glorifying and honouring to your name. Lord, that you protect us, Lord, from falling and stumbling. Lord, as Solomon felt at an old age, Lord, none of us are exempt. None of us, Lord, get to a point where we say we can't fall. Lord, I pray you protect each and every one of us. Lord, as we seek to serve you, to honour you in all that we do. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Praise God.